slides. So welcome, first of all, hello, Hack Quarantine. I hope everybody is doing very, very well. Um, uh, this time, unlike yesterday, I managed to get my uh, slides up and together. And so we're going to start today's workshop with just a little bit of stage setting, a little bit of uh, link sharing, both in the Discord and in um, uh, the Twitch stream. So let me just take a few moments to share all of the relevant links and show you just how meta this, uh, this project is, this workshop is, and how meta Platter itself is. So today, first of all, just so you know what our goals are, we are um, learning about React. React is a framework for uh, web development, which came originally out of uh, the, the universe that is Facebook. Um, it's a wonderful and very common, increasingly common tool uh, that helps you to build what are called single page web applications. That is apps that even though they feel like you're moving between a bunch of different screens with all kinds of content, just as if you were navigating a web server, are really in reality, just a giant payload of JavaScript, uh, which is manipulating the browser on the client side, fetching data from the server and giving you that kind of uh, uh, you know, multi-page application experience in what is technically just a single web page. Um, uh, as you can see here, my slides say, uh, first of all, that the presentation is not mobile friendly yet. Please use a desktop computer. Those are certainly instructions for me, but they are also instructions for you. So if I hop over to my Platter dashboard over here, you'll see that everything <laughs> uh, for this presentation is built in React. Uh, furthermore, it's built on Platter. And in some cases, like this one, I pushed the last update to our deck at um, uh, 4.31 p.m., so, so right after this workshop was uh, supposed to start. Sorry again for the delay there. Um, okay, so if I grab the site link here and I share it, which I will now do in Twitch. Boom, there we go. And I'm also gonna share it in the Discord. All right, um, we're about 10 seconds delayed when we stream. So just you know, acknowledge in one of those channels that you did get the uh, uh, slide links and that you're able to, uh, the slides link and that you're able to open it up, that would be great. I will, uh, meanwhile, hop over into the dashboard again and go to not only the React deck, but the React landing page. Um, this one requires a little more explanation. Uh, just know that we're gonna be working uh, for the workshop today on Platter's landing page itself. Uh, and so let me grab the link first. As you can see, I, I modified it a little bit. It's actually Platter Fork now, it's not Platter. Um, this is a, uh, so, oh, same error as you do, oh, React Deck Works. Oh, good, <laughs> okay, good, it, it looks like it works. Um, so I'm grabbing this link as well, and I'm gonna share it with you. Um, we have forked our entire uh, landing page for platter.dev itself, which is a Platter project. And uh, you and I, uh, dear audience, we're gonna work on it together today because it is a, uh, it's a production React app. Um, and unlike yesterday's workshop, where we kind of worked up from first principles and evolved uh, a web app out of JavaScript and CSS and HTML from nothing from scratch, here we're gonna do the bi-directional search thing. We're gonna start from an existing app and kind of explain a lot of the concepts that go into React when you use it in the real world. Okay, so this link I will share as well. There is that one. And in the Discord as well. Okay, perfect. So I've got those apps shared. Now, um, you can play around with those links if you want. Uh, what else? Meanwhile, back to the slides, back to our, well, what version should we use? We'll use the local version that I was, no, we, we use the same one that you're using uh, that I was running. Okay, so um, if I hop into this, just so you know, you can navigate with keystrokes. Uh, it's left and uh, right arrow, although you can also use down and up, a little secret hack for those of you streaming along live. Okay, so Platter, what is Platter, first of all? Uh, Platter is a, uh, it's a hosted cross-cloud platform instead of developer tools uh, that my co-founder and I, Alex, started, what is today? Oh my gosh, today <laughs> today is our one year birthday, I kid you not. Uh, so we started exactly one year ago, or at least that's when the company was incorporated. Um, uh, and it addresses a major pain point that we had in every job that we've been in our careers. So I've worked at startups, I've worked um, uh, 
uh, you know, at the university, just building websites. Uh, I've worked at big companies as well, like Groupon and Google as a software engineer. But in every place, one of the most frustrating things to me has, has been the fact that I try to start a new app or a new project. And there's so much uh, what I call activation energy necessary to get going. You have to set up your infrastructure, right? You have to set up your cloud deployment. You have to set up your continuous integration, your local developer tools. And by the time you get to having a, a feedback loop that is a way to test your idea to get it to users and to get feedback back from them, um, you've often lost steam, right? So if you're a startup, this means you spend three, four weeks, maybe even months um, of, of cash, of time, building something that's not your product, that's not your core competency. Um, and, and you get a, a lot fewer, uh, what we'd call in baseball, um, at-bats. You get fewer tries to build a good business. Uh, as developers at a hackathon, similarly, um, I'm sure you've seen this failure mode. I've both seen it and been involved in it. Um, you could spend eight hours, 16 hours, even the first day, like getting your team together and getting <laughs> set up on a, a, a new set of tools so you can even start to build your project. So Platter comes out of that pain point um, with, a, with a, a, a pretty radical value proposition that you should be able to click once to ship and scale anything. So what we're going to ship and scale today is React apps, um, but just know that uh, we have a long-term vision here, which is that uh, every dev should be able to build anything. You should be able to go to some menu, pick your platforms, um, click on them, and then find that uh, uh, you know, you're already started. You have your local tools set up, you have a feedback loop, and furthermore, that you're already deploying publicly as well so that you can just uh, you know, dispense with the funny business and get down to you know, what your actual business is. Okay, so a little about me before we get going. Um, uh, or, uh, I'm just gonna check in real quick and make sure everybody can see slides now. Oh good, happy birthday to Platter. Yes, awesome. Um, cool, so I am the CEO and co-founder of this company. Um, my uh, co-founder, Alex, is the CTO. And at some point when he gets it scheduled, I think he's gonna be teaching a Rust uh, workshop as well during this event. So yay, enjoy that. Um, our entire platform, by the way, if you're curious, is, is built in Rust. That's both the local developer tools as well as the cloud component that's making all of these uh, deployments of React apps for you. Um, so I love uh, not only to build stuff, um, but um, to me, the greatest output is actually the careers of the people around me. Uh, you should know that that probably flows out of what my first career was. This is a second career for me. I used to be a primary school band and chess club teacher. So I have um, uh, I've tripled the size of a school band when I was there. I was a teacher for five years. I built a chess club that had more than 100 kids. And one of the most rewarding things to me about that career has been uh, watching those people move on and themselves, in some cases, become uh, teachers, become band directors. Um, uh, we, we had you know, kids going to the national uh, chess championships and tournaments, et cetera. And, and this is my great joy. So now that I'm in the world of technology, of building software, I love to do the same just for um, you know, the people that work with me at the companies I'm at. Uh, but also the people I meet along the way uh, at events like Hack Quarantine. So I just want to encourage you, please, uh, you know, follow on Twitter, reach out on Twitter. Um, same with LinkedIn. Uh, send me a connect request. I, I won't refuse it. I usually go through and kind of batch say yes. I also won't promise that I'll get back immediately because I get a lot of uh, both connections and wonderful notes there and a lot of spam for outsourcing development. Um, but uh, connect with me on both places because I love to stay in touch at this event and well beyond it as well. Okay, so that's me. Uh, I told you a little bit about Platter. I inverted the operation a little bit. Um, what are our goals today in today's workshop? First of all, I wanna talk about why React. And when I say why React, I don't mean that we should, uh, you know, rah, 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 here's React, you should use it for everything. I wanna talk about the historical context in which React grew up as a framework. The, the pain points that it reacts to uh, uh, in order to help developers build better apps more quickly uh, you know, more reliable code, cleaner, more encapsulated code uh, versus the way that web apps have been built historically. Uh, so we're going to talk about the trade-offs, essentially, that React makes to, to get you some of those outputs, not just, like, why to use React all the time. Uh, we're going to talk about what React. We're going to briefly go through, like, the, the basic pieces of a React app and, uh, and how they come together in order to make a single-page application for you. Uh, we're going to do React on uh, the forked React landing, uh, sorry, Platter landing page that I sent you. So this is uh, 
both a Flatter project, that's our landing page, and a React app, just to review. Uh, and we're going to go through that. And uh, I have a feature request from somebody in the Discord earlier. Um, uh, she said, I believe, that our landing page was was not clear, and I should update the copy. So we're gonna we're gonna take that feature request, and we're gonna make that our project for today's workshop. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna show you how to deploy React sites really really quickly with Platter. This is why we built the platform, not just for React sites, but that's what we started with because we know that web apps are so important, um, you know, for hacks, for businesses that are just starting out, and in fact for even established companies to be able to to um, communicate with their users and and their customers. Okay, so with that, we are going to hop over to the whiteboard. Uh, I'm going to do my best to remember to actually switch my screens every time that I switch my context, unlike yesterday where I accidentally, <laughs> in my first stream ever, left, uh, left the screen in the wrong place. I'll check in on the chat, though, so I'll just ask you to alert me with emojis and uh, um, you know exclamation points and anything else that will catch my attention so I know that I haven't switched screens. So. Right now, I'm going to switch to the whiteboard, and I see it over there, and so you should be able to see it as well. Um, great. Uh, as I do that, I'm going to check in for any questions folks have. OK, no questions. Brilliant. OK, so um, these are a few of the uh, things, a, a, a few of the why uh, React items that um, uh, above here in this top line that React reacts to in web development, some of the problems with building applications uh, for the web that the set of tools we have uh, presents. Um, and then these down below are some of the features of React that help us to address those problems. Um, I'm going to switch back to the computer screen real quick um, just to show you what we did um, in yesterday's workshop. We started to build a web app. And we built it from scratch. Uh, it's it's not a very featureful web app, but it is indeed a web page, maybe not so much an app, uh, that has HTML in it. It has CSS and it has JavaScript. Um, we started to separate out the JavaScript and the CSS from the markup itself. Uh, the next step would have been to pull these individual files out. Um, but we should know that this set of technology uh, of technologies is not like it's not the be all end all. Uh, you know, very carefully considered, uh, polished tools that uh, allow you to do anything on the web. In fact, a lot of it is kind of evolutionary and in some cases even haphazard. Uh, for instance, know that JavaScript was not meant as a, as a language and, as a, uh, and the DOM you know, as a means of JavaScript accessing the uh, elements on a page. These things were not meant to build web applications. They were kind of a uh, a two-week-long hack, as it were, uh, uh, for Netscape, right? For, for, for this uh, old web browser to allow users as well as developers to just add fun little things, right? Like reacting to a, um, uh, an event in the browser so you could click and see a window alert pop up. Um, in fact, the strategy originally uh, for the first commercialized browser was to use Java for the large web applications and to relegate JavaScript to these kind of uh, secondary usages to add interactivity and, and uh, even you know, user hacking to the page. Uh, some, some great benefits come out of that, like we can play with JavaScript uh, very easily in the browser. Um, and if you didn't know, a little tidbit from yesterday's workshop, you can actually toggle the developer tools in VS Code itself. I'm in the um, uh, set of dev tools in VS Code and see that this editor is built in those same web technologies. You can hack on your browser. Um, you know, there's a, an API. This is like the back door way to do it, though. This is the way to, uh, to really see what's going on in the way that VS Code is implemented. So um, that, that haphazardness of JavaScript is actually a benefit in a way. The hooks are there for users to be able to play with and learn uh, from these tools. And that, that's a real advantage that we should uh, enjoy. So. Um, uh, anyways, aside or tangent, uh, backing up from that, uh, I just wanted to show you, you know, this, this is a web page, and it is where a React app starts, right? We're in reaction to building uh, uh, larger and larger applications with these same technologies that weren't necessarily meant to, to scale to large projects. So if we now go back to the report, there we go. Um, okay, so globals. One of the first problems with web development is that the whole thing is a giant global object. Um, 
it makes it a lot easier to bang around with the script, right? Uh, you can just say, hey, I want to access the window and look what's on the window. Um, now, scale your web app up to code from 10 different vendors who are all maybe adding their own variables to the global context. You have all kinds of um, you know, potential interactions that you wouldn't expect. You have uh, bad actors on the web able to access a lot of the context that your library might think is only its own. And, and there's a lot of problem with uh, these globals from, from that perspective. But as a developer, as someone building a web app, uh, you're also always having to consider the entire global context of, of the browser and of JavaScript and of the DOM as you build an app. It's a lot to keep in mind. And um, often, even when you try very carefully with, uh, with function scope to, to keep the pieces separate from each other, they end up interacting. So the way that uh, React addresses this is with components. Is its central abstraction is kind of a uh, um, a lot like actually back over here is, is a lot like an HTML element, but it's more than that. It's uh, in addition to the markup to the content, um, a component keeps track of its own state locally. So you can reason within just this ordered list. Say if this were a React component about what's going on here without thinking about necessarily what's going on in the body or going on in the global JavaScript context. It gives us a, a point of isolation to be able to uh, you know, make changes in our code base that don't change. It, I don't know if you've ever seen the web comic where somebody, uh, you know, there's three people lined up on a, 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 a doctor's bed and you hit the knee of the third person and the first person raises their hand, right? Like a reaction test. Um, uh, this is the problem of web development, and uh, this global context is really ameliorated or isolated uh, into pieces by components. So I'll come back down. Here we go. Um, the second thing is the DOM itself. So this is kind of an extension of global state, but the DOM or document object model um, is, is JavaScript's bridge to what is displayed in a web page. It's, uh, it's an API for accessing the state in the web page, for changing it, for getting um, uh, events that happen uh, based on user interaction with the web page. Uh, but for those of you that have, say, programmed maybe a large C code base, or if you've programmed a large web application that's not very principled, um, you'll, you'll know that this is a, a giant trap, right? It's a giant piece of shared mutable state um, that at any point, is coupled not only between the changes you make, but also like the redisplay and re-render of a page. It's a, it is a giant foot gun just waiting uh, to make your app not perform well or to make you make changes where you don't expect to that flash to the user. Um, and, and then the third bit here is, um, is uh, the browser itself, right? Uh, so there isn't just one browser, and especially at the time when uh, large single page apps started to be uh, launched, you know, I guess 2011, 2015, when um, uh, Angular and React came to the fore, there are still lots of cross-browser incompatibilities, but back then there were many, many, many more. Um, and so this cross-browser uh, kind of patching that you do when you build a web app, you have to account for all of the different vendors and all of the different ways in which they've implemented standards which are themselves always evolving. HTML and JavaScript and CSS are always changing. Um, and, and what this introduces to you as a developer is just a, a vast frontier that's always moving of things you need to know about and things you need to account for in your application before you can like give a stable experience to your users themselves. So the way that um, React deals with this, uh, this browser incompatibility is through um, Really, really two things. One is, is the virtual DOM, which I forgot to introduce. The virtual DOM is an in-memory representation of the browser that React creates in order to decouple these, these updates and these changes of state from the browser state itself. And the way that um, it helps to patch up browsers is by you know, accounting for those differences at the render layer. Um, and then on the input side, instead of just browser events coming directly from the user into your code, um, React uses a, a virtual or synthetic event system which uh, proxies the real browser events in through its cross-platform compatible own event system. So um, those of you that have played or programmed games know about rendering, right? The idea is 
you don't just update every pixel on the screen, just like you don't want to update every element in the DOM. What you do instead is you create a representation of the world, of the game world, or in our case, of the, uh, of the web browser. And then you let um, events on the inbound side and render, rendering on the outbound side um, you know, reflect the truth of that model on the, uh, on the target platform, in this case, the web browser. The separation of concerns makes working in React, um, you know, there's an additional layer of indirection, so you have to account for that sometimes. But the difference between this and going to grab some element in the DOM, making a change, hoping it's the right change, doing the same thing somewhere else in the DOM is, is just massive. So these three pieces, components, um, the virtual DOM that they uh, write to, and then the rendering of that virtual DOM and the um, synthetic events that are abstracted from the browser give you just a much cleaner box in which to, to test your idea and to build your application. So that is kind of what and why React all together. Um, but we're not here to just like talk about the virtues of a framework. I really want to work through some uh, specific examples with you. So. Hopping back up to the screen. Don't worry, we're not going to build a whole React app inside of our yesterday's uh, web app. We're just going to cancel this out. We're going to say, uh, no, I don't want to save those changes. No, don't save that. OK, back from the whiteboard to an app. OK, so uh, a moment of just meta grounding and explanation here again. A long time ago, um, we didn't have a platform and we didn't have a landing page and we were just a very young software company kind of playing with tools on localhost. Um, as soon as we could though, as soon as we built our cloud platform, which looks like in October 4th, 2019, uh, we decided to do some extreme dog fooding. That is, we used our tools as soon as we could to build something that was critical to the company. And that was our landing page. If you go to platter.dev, um, you see this page. It's uh, just, just a single page landing app. It's got a header. It's got a section about how our app works. It's got a terribly out of date demo video. Um, some of the tools you'll see in this video are out of date if you're using Platter now by yourself, but you'll see some of them today because our landing page was built with those tools. Uh, lots of meta problems here. And then you know link, link to uh, the app itself to go play with Platter. So really simple landing page and you know something you might be interested in um, building something similar to uh, for your for your hackathon project. It's something to communicate uh, the value of whatever it is you're building. So that's our landing page, which is also a Platter app built on the Platter pa platform, which we have forked uh, to another Platter project over here in my dashboard again. It's called React Landing Page. Um, and to tell the difference, we've called the company instead Platter Fork. So we're going to go through this application and make some changes in the context of this React app, and along the way, explain how React works, what React is. Um, but before we do that, we need to uh, uh, get this thing going for local development. So let's do that real quick. We've got VS Code. Here's our production version. Um, we don't want to work in prod, though. Uh, arguably, so we're going to open up. Uh, let's see here. I just want to open. I don't want to open a particular one. There we go. And from scratch. This is my real computer. As you can see, this is not a demo machine. Um, so if I go into projects and presentations, React landing page, I forked this repo um, from GitHub, and we want to open actually just diving in the web app. Um, quick note, historical note, uh, Platter did and does still, although they're not publicly available right now, also have um, desktop and mobile apps. These are React Native uh, apps as well as Electron and React um, uh, desktop applications. This is where that any dev should be able to build any kind of project comes in. We're just really working on polishing them before we uh, release them again for, for public consumption. So hopping into the web page itself is where we want to go. And we open that in VS Code. Cool. Um, pop a terminal open here. Get rid of the Explorer. Hopefully the text is big enough for everyone to see. Everyone see it? Good. Okay. 
Cool. I'll, I'll check in about 10 seconds to see if that is not big enough. So first of all, normally you would um, start any Platter app that you've created with Platter Start. We've built this cross-platform CLI that spins up uh, any project, no matter what components it has, with the same command. Um, yet again, so that instead of spinning up four different uh, separate repositories with different commands and figuring out the networking to put these pieces together, uh, if you've started anything in Platter, you can just Platter Start. But this is actually, this is an ancient app, which was built with a tool called BP. Um, so we're going to BP start instead. BP is short for Boiler Platter, the original name of our company. Oh, nice. What have we got going on here? Right. This is an old version of the tool, so it doesn't even know what directory it's in. Very sad. BP start. Okay, that's better. <laughs> so we'll wait. This thing will probably give us... Um, oh, look at that. It's the old Electron desktop app. All right. Well, we don't need that. So we'll get rid of that. Um, Here's our web app coming up as well. It might even, so this was built with uh, React Native and Expo. It might try to spin up a mobile app. We'll see. <laughs> I'm not sure. OK, cool. There is Platter Fork. There's our app. And just to show what the feedback cycle uh, looks like, anytime you build something with Platter uh, and you Platter Start, or BP Start in this case, whenever you edit any source file, uh, we're listening and we have a dev server set up so that if I pop into the app.js, ooh, that's a little hack. Look at that. Scroll threshold equals six pixels. Pixels before we make header transition. Oh. OK, anyways, anytime that we make a change in our code, ready to try Flatter, how it works, we're going to say it's ready to try Flatter. We're going to make that are you ready to try Platter. Every time we make a change and save, then our dev server should rebuild the app, uh, display it over here, obviously in this case, break the very careful layout that we made, and uh, and you see the difference. Um, so this is our local feedback loop, which al allows us as devs to just run one command and be iterating already, no matter what our uh, computer setup is. Notice there's no downloads of uh, dependencies here. Everything runs inside of Docker. OK, so now we've got a feedback loop. Now our tools are giving us a way to make changes. Uh, so the exact language um, of, uh, of the request, oops, I guess that needs to say ready to try platter, like so, was that the landing page was unclear. And it took like um, you know three quarters of the way through me doing some demo wherever I was doing it in order to understand what was going on. So backing out to our task, what we're going to do here is update this React app and on route, see just how a React app works. Let me uh, briefly, let's see, pop this over into a kind of silly looking mobile width so we can get a little more screen real estate on a React app. OK, so we are in a JavaScript file, uh, which is app.js. Um, if we want to start a new one of these up, we can use Platter, but know that Platter just uses a very popular uh, framework um, for starting React apps called Create React App. I'm going to do it from scratch in a terminal so there's not quite so much context so you understand exactly what's going on here. If you, you know, either with npm or yarn, which I use, yarn global add create React App. And please, I encourage you, if you're on your computer at home, uh, uh, follow along with this. I, I mean this to be a workshop in the sense that you actually get to do this stuff, but not just that I show you how it's done. So we can add that, which I think we already have. Maybe it will update, though. Oh, oh man, I'm in ASDF. So this is going to take a while to uh, shim. Yes. Word to the wise, I'm using ASDF to wrap uh, node n to manage my many versions of JavaScript, of, of node, and of npm locally. And uh, when you do it this way, it's great, because you can use ASDF, the command line tool, to manage Python, and Ruby, and everything else. However, it's sometimes uh, quite slow in doing so, uh, because it needs to reshim every dependency when you do a global install inside of NPM and Yarn. If that means nothing to you, then ignore that I said it. But 
if you're really into package managers and local uh, environment management, just, just know that about ASDF. Okay, so anyways, we've got create React app going here now. And we're gonna create one. Create React app, um, hello world. Not very creative. Right, can't have capital letters. Probably should use a kebab case name like hello world. Gonna take a while because there's a lot of depths for a create React app created React app. Um, so we'll wait for those to download. Yet again, I'm doing this just to show you end to end how you can create your own React apps locally without necessarily using any proprietary tools like Platter. Um, so you npm or yarn add create React app, and you run it, and it sets up many defaults for you. The reason this is a great tool, and in fact is one of the product inspirations uh, for Platter itself is that it gets you into a feedback cycle, although there's obviously lots of console action going on here. It gets you into a feedback cycle where you don't have to set up Webpack and um, you know dependency uh, bundling and code minification and all of these things that go into a real production web app. You can just start one this way and then immediately have your source folder and your setup and you can yarn start and it will uh, it will run your web app. So we did this though to show you that the structure of the code base that's created here is, uh, is the same structure that we're working in in our other context. You have an app, which is the main component of your application. Um, there's a, a kind of basic test file. There's a separate CSS file as well. Um, and then there are a few uh, pieces at a slightly higher level, these index uh, files that then correspond to, in the public folder, index.html. And this is where the rubber meets the road, where React and its whole framework and rendering meet an actual web page that you can load. Uh, so this is the structure of a Create React app. It's also the structure of what we're working on over here. Um, this app.js is just quite a bit bigger. Okay. So, um, looking through here, um, there's a few features to discuss. First of all, this is, a, um, this is a JavaScript class. If anyone is confused by seeing a class in JavaScript, this is, if, if you learned JavaScript a while back, um, this is just one of the many innovations going on in JavaScript land. The idea is to create a much more object-oriented programming-like wrapper around uh, what in JavaScript are prototypal objects. Um, <laughs> since we're not in a JavaScript class, I won't uh, discuss too far, but you could create something like this class with just function objects, just a bunch of functions nested inside of each other. This just gives you a nice, convenient um, uh, syntax that looks a lot more like object-oriented programming. So this is our entire app, and it's got a couple handlers set as methods on the app. Uh, one is like handle sign up toggle. So we're going to make a change right now. Um, oh, you know what? That is ghost code. That is from when this was a landing page that didn't even have an app to try. So we're going to delete the ghost code. We're going to save. We're going to find that we have an error because we probably referenced that handler somewhere. Nope, we're good. Okay. Um, let's look at handle scroll, actually. So here, uh, pop the console on our website. Look at it. Okay, so to show that this is uh, uh, a handler that happens every time that we scroll the website like so, we're going to, in addition to setting the state inside of the uh, component itself, we're also going to, uh, this set state, very good, here's our handler, we're going to console.log um, the event, the scroll event itself. Okay, so save that going to become a very chattery scroll now. And there we are scrolling. And as you can see down here, the uh, scroll events are, are um, in the console. Okay. So instead of having to set in some function somewhere and find a DOM element to add a handler to, as we started to do yesterday, 
what we're able to do is say, hey, I'm inside of my React app. I'm not considering the page or the global context. I just want to create a handler, as we have here, and then in our render function, which is the main, um, uh, this is the function that tells React, the framework, how to create the application itself. We're saying, hey, return the header, return all this stuff, um, and then somewhere in here, uh, very good, our header takes a scrolled state. So notice that when I'm up here in the web page, there's, it's got a transparent background. When I start to scroll past six pixels, as we know from our hard-coded magic number, um, then it changes state. Um, so instead of finding the particular DOM element here and changing its background, what we've done instead is inside of our app component, created a listener, um, set it up over here. Oh, there's so much in VS Code that pops up when you're hovering. Um, when the component mounts, when React creates this actual, actual page, we say, hey, at that point, I want you to add an event listener, right? And that event listener, I want it to handle the scroll. Um, we don't have to like, figure out when the component has mounted or when the page is loaded. And furthermore, we just create a compo component will unmount a uh, listener down here. And we say, hey, when this app is ready to go away, when the user navigates away from Platter Fork, I want you at that point to remove the event listener for scroll. So what we've introduced uh, ourselves to here is what are called lifecycle methods. These are two lifecycle methods, component did mount, and component will unmount that give us, instead of having to consider that whole globals and DOM and you know cross-browser compatibility between events, we're instead saying, just like you would in like a C++ game rendering framework, hey, uh, something is unmounting, something is mounting. I'd like to add some behavior at that point, an event listener in this case. Um, the handle click away, I'm guessing, was to dismiss the, uh, the sign-up form when it was there. Uh, but yet again, we don't have that sign-up form anymore because we have an app after all. Okay, so the third um, lifecycle method we saw was render. Let me stop and just pop over and see if there are any questions yet. Ooh, can we follow along with this part? Do you know if ASDF can be used on Windows? I don't know on Windows, honestly. Um, there is a... I want to say it's for... Uh, Linuxes and I, I mean Mac OS, which is technically not a Linux, it's a BSD based variant. I'm not sure that ASDF works for Windows, but don't cite me on that. Let's look it up, actually. Uh, ASDF Windows. Add Windows support. Issue 450. Let's see if it's resolved or closed. <laughs> closed. Maybe, hard to say. Okay, well, I'll, I'll let someone uh, look that one up as an exercise to the reader, and please just hit, hit us up on the uh, on the Twitch stream and uh, let us know if you find that it does have Windows support or not. Okay, great, back to the app. So we are in a component, and I want to point something out in this render function. So our lifecycle method or function here is render, and we're immediately returning something, just as you would in plain JavaScript, but what we're returning looks pretty strange, right? This is not normal JavaScript. What this is, is a language called uh, JSX. So one of the things that Create React set up for us is, um, is code transformation to take this very HTML looking language called JSX and transform it to a bunch of actual underlying JavaScript function calls. So React, yet again, remember, we're not working in HTML here. We're, we're creating uh, virtual elements in a virtual DOM. Um, but the abstraction lets us think as if we're writing HTML right inside of our JavaScript. So um, instead of having separate files that we're switching through to say, hey, here's the handler in JavaScript. What does the structure of the HTML look like? Oh, I changed the structure of the HTML, and thus I need to change the way I find the element to attach the handler to. We're instead thinking, just like an object-oriented programmer would, hey, here's my class component. Um, and it's got a couple things going on. Whenever this thing loads, whenever the framework makes it load, add those handlers. And then here is what it looks like. Now, if we look at the header itself, what we'll find is that there is also a file 
let me add another terminal down here. I find it faster in VS Code, for those of you that are just starting to use this tool like I am, to actually just um, often like navigate inside of the terminal and open stuff via code and then the name of the file. So we're going to look now at the header. There it is. Okay, cool. So here is our header component. Um, note, this is just yet another component. It's another class which has a render method. So nested inside of our app, there's a header. Nested inside of that header, by the way, we're using H1s, just like we would in, uh, in HTML. Uh, we're using anchor tags or links, just as we would in HTML. But yet again, remember, these are not actual anchor tags in H1s. These are uh, just being translated to JavaScript function calls to render this stuff in a virtual DOM and let React take care of like race conditions for rendering, when to remove and add things, etc. Um, okay, so back into our app, let's make a few changes. Let's do the scientific method here. So we have a separate header header component. You can see this is a pretty hacked code base. This was a uh, I coded this one pretty fast, but it's the real world. So here we are. Um, Okay, so our header corresponds to that bit we know. There's a main div here, which has a hero, and I made a terrible pun and called the component hero. And then there's a how it works section down here, which obviously I didn't take the time to turn into a separate component, but let's go ahead and do that. Um, well, actually, let's see how many handlers are in it. Uh, you know what, the onClick is, is going to make that a little tough, so let's not move that into a separate component. But let's make some changes. Okay, so um, back up to the top. Click once, build anything. Pretty vague. We're going to say here, instead of click once, build anything, we need to open our Euro component, code Euro. There we go. Click once. And then there's a break and then build anything. We're going to say the fastest way to build a React app. We're going to save that and see that change. So just to go back to our mental model, we didn't update the DOM there. What happened is React said, hey, here's what this component looks like when it's run, right? And then when we loaded the page, the page loads a bunch of JavaScript that creates a representation that then is rendered to the page, just like in a game engine. Um, and then we've got a div here, which has a mouse and a rocket. These are nasty SVG components, if I remember correctly. Platter helps developers and businesses quickly ship, operate, and scale products across, across clouds and user platforms. That is also unclear. Platter makes your app flatter. Let's see, flatter helps you go faster. All right, perfect. <laughs> cool, so we've got that now. Now we're onto something more substantial. So we're editing just like we were in HTML, but yet again, we're not in HTML, we're in JavaScript. Uh, you have the same interactive feedback loop as you would just creating a page, but you're actually creating a, a fairly complex JavaScript app. Now we've got something a little more complex here though. We've got a button which is called Euro Down, terrible naming, um, wrapped inside of a div probably for some layout issues uh, with a click handler that's handle click to scroll. So if we look on our class component, here's our handler, handle click to scroll. Um, and then we are doing some math over this. This is so we're bridging across to the actual um, uh, DOM elements here to get the client height. We, we could clean that up if we wanted to, but we won't for now. And then we're scrolling um, down to the top of the scroll target, uh, which is a number that's based on the, on the height of this element uh, with smooth scrolling. All right. Uh, that window.scroll to, by the way, is a, um, is a, uh, a patched like function that crosses yet again all of the differences between browsers, in particular Safari in this case, which, which is pretty nasty there. Um, so we are going to, well, we don't need to change that. It looks pretty good. Okay, so we scroll down, how it works. Um, 
and this is what's going to get us into some uh, some props and state what we really want to be looking at okay so render mouse rocket div helps you go faster there's our down button how it works if we go back to our app is here and then we get into a component that's a little more interesting so let's look at the instructions component code instructions cool now we're doing props okay so yet again here is a react um, component but there's a difference this is what's called a, a, a dumb component. Notice this isn't a class anymore. This is just a function. So const instruction and the convention when you create React components is to create all caps components like this. Instruction equals, and then this is a function that takes props and then returns some JSX, something that looks a lot like HTML. Um, so props, if we look down here, are the little bits that you insert just like attributes and values. So we've now created kind of what you can con consider almost like a custom HTML element that um, is saying, like, whatever you give me, I'm going to parse into it. So in props, you can pass me a title. And that's the thing which we use down here, which is ship. And if we look at the instruction component, okay, what do we do with the title? we display it as an h3. And so we see in our web page, okay, there's this. And if we inspect that element, we see, okay, so it's an h3. So we've rendered from this component an h3, but we now have a reusable bit of code that we can use every time we want an instruction. Okay, this thing takes an emoji. That emoji needs to be wrapped for um, accessibility reasons inside of a span that has an ARIA label. This is web accessibility. Um, and then let's add that emoji right there, right? So yet again, we pass into this element as an attribute when we use it into this uh, component, the emoji prop. So props are a way for a developer to define reusable HTML-like elements that take state from above them, from, from some parent component, and render based on, 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 that, um, on the value that's passed in. Same thing here, emoji label. This is where we use it for accessibility. Um, so that is props. Now let's, uh, let's move back to our app. Let's see if there's any significant state inside of this app. I believe there is. And if we go back to app, we'll see that on this much more um, complex component, we're setting up just a, a variable here um, called state. So this is, a, this is set on the component, which is called app. Uh, at the beginning when you instantiate it and we set a two items in the state um, there's this scrolled item which is something we read from the window you know what's the starting page y offset that's how far you are scrolled in a window uh, when you load and um, you know is it greater than five so if it's greater than five we're saying our window is scrolled like so um, and then we're also there's a state here called signup shown, which yet again is from when we had a signup form. We'll ignore that for now. Um, when we're scrolling, so in our scroll handler, we're saying, hey, we want to do something in reaction to an event that sets state. What we use is um, this set state method, which will, in, a, in an event friendly and race condition free way, um, reset this state every time that this uh, event handler is called. So what we've avoided here by being able to just declare a method that handles the scroll and attach it um, to our component is, uh, is you know, if you're using jQuery, what you have to do at this point is like query down from the um, context of your function, wherever it is, all the way to a particular DOM element um, to, uh, to set a handler uh, hopefully remember to remove that event handler when you don't need it anymore. Instead, we just say, hey, I want to handle the scroll event. But what this um, scroll handler does is it sets state that this app is tracking. So we're not setting anything on the window. There's no global variable here. Like if we go into the cons console and we say, you know, scrolled. Is there anything? Nope, scrolled is not a defined uh, 
reference on the on the variable. So we've got real encapsulation here. We've got um, something that we're only tracking here, and that only this component and its uh, child components can uh, can look at. Uh, and what we do with this state is we pass it down. This is where states, uh, state and props are combined. We pass it down directly into a component as a prop. So if we look back at our he header component, we take the state of our application, we pass it down as a prop to the header component, and the header then is able to say, hey, if you have got, let's see, we're, we're scrolled, scrolled. If you're scrolled, <laughs> a gnarly little uh, ternary uh, expression in here. If this component is in an app, which is scrolled, is what we're saying here, then we are going to set the class name of our header to scrolled or not scrolled, right? And then what that is going to do is dynamically change actually on the web page itself as you make this uh, uh, scroll event the, um, the state at the top level of the application and pass it down as props. The reason React is called React is that it's it's like this this view layer that allows you to react to these um, these props, this um, this application uh, value that's been being changed by the user. And instead of like setting a handler in each of these components to um, detect when you you've scrolled or not, you set it at the highest level context, and then you just pass that through as data. So these components react to that data and they change their state without you now thinking about, hey, when I change this, I need to change this other thing. You instead have a single state at the top that's passed down as props through the tree of, of child components to make the difference uh, wherever you need it. Um, so this is the starting pattern of React. There are many ways as you build larger apps to, to, um, you know, to centralize that state, to handle it when you're starting to fetch, for instance, from uh, backend services to uh, make the whole app react uh, not to state on a component, but rather to something like a Redux store, which is a, a central way to control your application state that's not inside of that top level component. Um, but uh, anyways, that's, that's the idea be behind uh, props and state. So the rule of thumb there is at the highest level where you need to know about a change, you set that change as state, right? Like you track that change via setting a variable like our is scrolled variable that we looked at. And then you use that state as a prop to child components to change their behavior based on it. So the way that all rolls up in this feature is at the top level, we have our app and we scroll. That changes state in our app component over here. And then that state is passed down as props to different elements, in this case, the header, to say, hey, the page is scrolled. I'd like for you to not be transparent anymore, for you to become an opaque header. OK, cool. Um, so that is React components. That is um, state and props, which are really the central features. We could probably do like an eight-hour workshop and really get into the details of React, but uh, knowing about components and smart and dumb components like you do now, that is like these class components handling state versus just the function components like the um, instruction that we looked at here and knowing the function of state and props in tracking um, your application state and in uh, you know conditioning the way you render your different components, that's, that's enough to be able to dive into a React code base understand what's going on and start to make changes. Uh, now, I, I know I've terribly neglected the um, Twitch feed, so I want to hop over here and see uh, where we're at. Ooh, can we follow along with this part? Do you know? OK, no other questions, no additional questions. So I think we're good on this. But um, I would like to hop over uh, in the feed if I can. There we go. OK, so um, just to review, we looked at React. We talked about why React. We worked through some React changes. They were kind of silly little changes since we were in an existing app, but hey, welcome to most of uh, actual software development on the job, which is changing existing code in order that we could understand the flow of data and the, the way that a, a React site renders. I wonder what questions you all have.
No questions is cool if we don't have any. I do have one more thing I want to show you, which is, is where the rubber meets the road, is where the React page is actually rendered in HTML. Um, it will take 30 seconds to do that. So I showed you um, the public versus the source directory. You can think of the source directory in a React app as like, here's where the stuff is, uh, uh, where the React apps, oh, there we go. Any page you recommend to go deeper into React? Yes, the best page for React is actually the, re the like official React docs. Excellent, excellent docs. And if you go to reactjs.org, you'll see um, there's a great tutorial, which of course will, um, because you're at your own pace, can really help you to um, uh, go a little more systematically through what we just took a slapdash tour through. Uh, but in addition, it's got great docs, which talk about the main concepts, things like we talked about, you know, JSX, rendering, components and props, state and lifecycle, handling events, this is a conditional rendering, which we looked at as well. So we got through about uh, main concept number seven in these docs. Uh, after that, you'll see things like uh, how to create lists of components um, by using you know, JavaScript to react uh, to like, just like a for loop to iterate through and create components um, and, and how to uniquely identify each of those with keys, um, how to handle forms. Because remember, we're trying to keep all of our state out of out of the DOM, out of this very um, failure prone and render bound um, uh, framework for, for both state and visualization. Forms are one place where like the state of the DOM is, is critical. When you complete a web form and you hit submit, um, it, you know, your code is usually reading values directly out of that DOM representation. So how in memory to handle that data instead in forms, how to, um, to lift state up, which is like an operation for um, uh, pulling state higher in your component tree, um, et cetera. But we went through most of the main concepts you need to understand the way a React app works and renders and is composed. Uh, there's some great advanced guides as well, which talk about, I mean, well, everything you need to build like a production web app versus just a, a toy web app. Um, I, I do also just wanna make a quick plug. Like there's a lot to learn here, right? Just in React itself. You can use Create React App um, to create an app, and then you have to figure out, like, how do I get this thing deployed as well? So yet again, the problem Platter was built to solve is, uh, oh, did I do a thing where I didn't switch the window? <laughs> I probably did. Yes, I did. I made it all the way to the end without doing it. But let me just pop over. There we go, okay. So, sorry, I was looking at reactjs.org. Uh, which has got a getting started guide, advanced guides, main concepts on this uh, sidebar here. So I just want to show you briefly in Platter itself, all the way to the top. Um, first of all, if you have a GitHub account, you have a Platter account, you just OAuth with it. Um, but we've turned that whole process of setting up and deployment into this. So hey, you want to build a React site? Start, let's name it, my HQ project, hit enter. We hit tab and then enter. So what we're doing when you hit deploy inside of Platter is a few things. Since we've auth with GitHub, we're actually creating for you a repository that has the whole, in this case, React uh, application set up. So here is, you know, there's public and source, just like we looked at. Um, here's a repository which has all of the code for a, uh, um, a deployable React web application. In addition, though, we've also created your first deployment. So that is underway already. And in fact, every time that you update um, the, the master branch in GitHub, you just pop in and I'll do that in GitHub itself because that's kind of silly and fun that you can do that. But also to show you how it kicks off deployments for you, I'm gonna say instead of your web app, it is my new web app. Yet again, React components inside of React components inside of React components. We're not looking at HTML. And we're gonna save that with an elucidating uh, error uh, commit message like it is done. Don't do this at home. Actually make meaningful commit messages, but commit changes. So as soon as your code is updated in GitHub, what Platter does is creates another deployment. So here you can see, even though the first one's not done, we're already creating a second deployment that will ship those changes to the public website for your users. Um, 
the third piece, which you can find inside of a repo once you've created it, is that um, instead of setting up all your local node and JavaScript tools, etc., cetera, um, Platter is also a local CLI. When you saw me over here um, do a BP start, if I go into a more modern uh, React Platter project, there we go. It will change into ladders. Got a lot of them here. Let's go into the one called Hack Quarantine. Um, even if you don't have Node installed locally, once you have the Platter um, command installed, the CLI, you can just Platter start. And it will start that piece. So there are web containers ready. It's going to start the local development, the local dev server, and you're already coding. You're making changes to the file, saving them, and then you see the results locally as well. So those two feedback loops is what we're really after setting up for, for users. That's a web example, but we do the same. Oh, nice. Um, we do the same for uh, full stack apps as well. Uh, any, any application architecture that we add to the platform will be able to be started the same way. So I know I'm probably, yeah, I'm about six minutes over time. I want to see if there were any more questions before I hop off and you all hop off as well. Any questions here? Any questions there? Oh, it seems it can get very complex when you have many different components that feed props into each other. Uh, yes, it, it certainly can. Like um, the size of a web application, uh, especially when it has multiple pages, one of the things we didn't look at is like, uh, you know, using a, the standard library here, it would be React. Uh, sorry, let me pop back up to this view. React Router, um, you can have multiple pages inside of a React app that then themselves have their own component trees. But the, the beauty of, the, of uh, both the React components, but HTML as well, is that it is indeed a tree. That is, inside of any single component, you have children and you have states and props passing down but you have a point of isolation you can look at. So when I'm coding on a React app, unlike when I'm coding in JavaScript that's like linked into the DOM at various different places uh, via um, you know, event handlers and event handling, I can look at my instructions component, for instance, and like I have, okay, I'm just looking at instructions. I know that this renders to that place in the uh, um, web app itself over here. Sorry, Let's get this to go the right way. There we go. I know that that's this region here, these three instructions and their headers, but I don't have to reason about the surrounding page. I can just look at this. So the deeper you dive down your um, your tree of components, at each point you can just reason about the code that's local and the state that's local and the props being passed down. So uh, unlike in a kind of raw web development, you now have a uh, a much better point of isolation within which to only consider the things going on there. It's a great question or a great observation. All right. Oh, yes, screen. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Um, here's our instructions component uh, with just single instructions inside of it. I'm not thinking about the page context of this large web app up here. I'm only looking at just this one component, right? If I'm in uh, HTML and JavaScript, I'm probably looking in the middle of a large HTML page, switching over to a JavaScript page to see what behavior I'm adding. It's just not the same level of isolation of pieces of your application. OK. Um, so go to reactjs.org if you want to learn more. Go to platter.dev if you want to very quickly um, deploy one of these things. And uh, I guess that's all that I have. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care.